Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley Forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. We would like to thank our streaming sponsor, AARP Utah, for making our virtual forums this fall possible. We would also like to thank our media sponsor, KCPW, for recording and rebroadcasting our forums as part of the Hinckley Radio Hour. We would also like to thank Ross Chambles for his help orchestrating today's event. Today's forum is Amendment C, What Does It Mean to Abolish Slavery from Utah's Constitution in 2020? And is presented um, in partnership by the Utah Coalition to Abolish Slavery. We are joined by panelists, Kamau Allen, organizer for the Abolish Slavery Network, National Network, Sen Senator Jacob Andereg, Utah State Legislature, Aaron Castro, founder slash co-director of the University of Utah Prison Education Project, Representative Sandra Hollins of the Utah State Legislature, Lecher, and William Smith, Professor and Department Chair um, of Education, Culture, and Society at the University of Utah. Today's conversation will be moderated by Liz Adiola, host and producer at PBS. If you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them into the YouTube chat. And with that, I will turn the time over to our moderator. Thank you and welcome everyone for being here. Thank you for taking the time out for this important discussion about what it means to abolish slavery in 2020 here in Utah. Uh, I am pretty much a transplant here, fairly new, and I got here in 2018 and was really shocked to see this story that slavery was still on Utah's constitution. Um, Representative Hollins, can you talk a little bit about why this was brought forth in the legislature and why it was important to do this now? Sure. Um, this was, this, I'm sorry, I'm hearing double feedback. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna talk and sound like the question you asked me was, um, how did all of this get started? How did I um, start the process of trying to um, take this out of slavery, uh, take slavery out of Utah's constitution? So this was actually brought to my attention that it was a part of Utah's constitution in 2018. Um, I was watching what was happening in Colorado um, and I happened to have had a conversation with someone in the media about what Colorado was doing, not thinking that it was a part of Utah's constitution. It never dawned on me to, that this would be in different states throughout the United States. And so I, um, she called me one night, someone in the media called me one night and wanted to know, um, am I aware that this is still a part of Utah's constitution? And I couldn't, like everyone else, I was shocked and could not believe that it was in our constitution. And so um, she sent me over, Brittany sent me over all of the information about it and I started looking at it and she asked me a very poignant question. What are you gonna do about it? And my response was, well, we're gonna remove it. It's gonna take it out. We're gonna take it out because when you started looking at when this was placed in Utah's constitution, it was after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so it should have never been placed in our constitution to begin with. And so um, that was the start of the, the process of writing um, HJR 8, the, resol 8, the resolution to place this on our ballot for this year. Senator Anderick, how did you get involved in all of this? Oh, I'm sorry. It took me. I had to turn off Glenn Beck radio for. Okay, I'm I'm with you now. I'm just teasing. Um, I got a phone call from Salt Lake Tribune reporter. You know, whenever there's one of these stories, they always like to call someone from the other side just to see if we'll stick our foot in our mouth. And I was like, uh, "This is still in our constitution. This is stupid." And I think they were a little surprised that I was so supportive of Representative Holland's efforts. So I, as soon as I was off the phone with her, I texted Sandra, I was just like, hey, do you need a Senate sponsor on this? Cause this is like a no brainer. It's, 
in my mind and in my heart, slavery is something that is a really dark history of our past. And I wasn't raised this way. So when we found out that it was in the constitution, I was like, you know what? Our, the words of our documents matter. They do. And so when it became you know, possible and Sandra's like, yeah, I'd, I'd love your help in the Senate. I was like, okay, let's get this thing across the line. And to that end, I just want to point out, there, there aren't many bills that come through the legislative process that go through a House committee and the House floor and a Senate committee and the Senate floor and not get a single negative vote. And that's what this bill had. So I think it's a, it's a testament to the fact that, yeah, we've got Republicans, we've got Democrats, we've got a supermajority Republican legislature. But when, it, when it's things like this that I think truly matters, it, we were absolutely aligned. I mean, if you look at Sandra and I's voting record, I think we vote together like 92% of the time. So uh, I think it's a testament to who we are. But it did have to be amended. Can you share what, why that was necessary? I think, if you don't mind, Sandra, um, there were a couple of senators who wanted to make sure that there were aspects of a judicial discretion for community service as a means of, of a lesser uh, penalty, right? They just wanted to make sure that we didn't inadvertently remove that aspect of it. So that, that it was just to make it absolutely clear that slavery is gone, involuntary servitude is gone, but if you're agree agreeable to a, 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 a plea down of what your sentence might be, we can give you community, community service versus jail time. So that we just want to make that sure that that was absolutely clear. Yeah. And besides that, what was what was the reception when this was introduced? What was the feedback that you got? Representative Hollins, what do you think? The feedback was um, was 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 very positive. It was very positive when it was presented in the House, when I first presented this and it was in the House, um, the audience was packed. The audience was was full. And um, the chair um, asked who in here is um, would like to speak against this bill and nobody said anything. He said, who's here to speak in favor of this bill? Please stand up. And everyone in the audience stood up, said that they were there to speak in favor of, of this bill. So in the public, I've been receiving um, lots of pos more positive feedback than negative. Um, and, and up at the Capitol, we've been receiving more positive than negative. Um, I remember when I first decided to run this bill, I happened to be up at the Capitol and I saw the Republican leadership. They were there and we got to talk and it was like, well, why are you up here at the Capitol? And I said, well, I'm working on this piece of legislation. Um, and, um, and I told them what it was. And of course they couldn't believe that it was still in our constitution. And their immediate response was, we're on board. We want to be on board with this. We want to work with you on this. This needs to be, this, this do not need to be about politics. This is, this is just common sense that this needs to be taken out and we're totally on board with this and, and, and backing you in this. And you said it, it, it didn't need to be about politics. Um, and I, I know there are probably other misconceptions surrounding it, but is this strictly about race? Um, you know what, it, it's, it's more about human beings. Um, and the reason I said that is because we also have to remember um, that not only were Africans enslaved in this state, but also Native Americans in this state were enslaved. And slavery is morally wrong, whether it's about Africans, whether it's about our Native, about the Native American population, no matter what it's about, it's wrong. But we know that this piece of legislation was specifically written about the African slaves. And Dr. Smith, can you touch upon the history of, of slavery and how this could have came to be here in Utah as a part of the Constitution? Well, you know, slavery impacted the entire country, actually, um, essentially the whole world. And anti-Blackness is global. So this is um, just part of a systemic structure that expanded westward uh, with the settling of um, the Eastern seaboard of the United, what became the United States. So, I mean, what we saw from what some people might argue as the first um, enslaved people coming in 1619, 
um, as agreed upon date or year, it really was earlier than that. So some historians argue that you can look into Mexico and see enslaved Africans there a hundred years prior. So, so this, this part of the world has had a history of enslaving Africans all the way to 1865 and then have enslaved-like systems with the uh, Jim Crow era and the Black Coast that preceded that. So Jim Crow would extend all the way into the 1960s. And if you read Michelle Alexander's work, uh, The New Jim Crow, she makes an argument that it expanded all the way, what I would say, to 2020, when you could see that someone like a George Floyd could be killed in broad daylight by a police officer who puts his knee on his neck as he cries for his mother and for air. And come out, you, you've called this the new Jim Crow. You, you've called legislation like this, not, not the, le, the le, you know, these, you've called what was written in the constitution a part of the new Jim Crow. Can you talk about the work that you did in Colorado to get this overturned and to get changed, not just in your state, but nationwide? Thank you. So it is an absolute honor to be on this uh, panel, but more so it is an absolute honor to support other states that are uh, fighting to replicate what we have done in Colorado in 2018. This fight was deeply personal to me when I, when I first started in uh, 2018. I, um, I'm an organizer with Together Colorado. Um, and through Together Colorado, I was able to participate in our second um, attempt to abolish slavery from Colorado State Constitution. I was serving as the facilitator and the lead organizer of the steering committee of that campaign. We, um, we had to run it a second time because the first go around failed because it, um, about 1% of voters um, uh, voted more in favor of um, keeping it in the constitution as opposed to removing it. And a part of the reason for that is because of how confusing the language appeared on the um, on the ballot and you know we just wanted to run a much uh, stronger campaign. Um, what do you think people were confused about that first time around? Well uh, the way that the language appeared on the ballot it, it was like a triple negative. Um, nobody really knew exactly what they were voting on. Um, uh, in, in addition to that we uh, there wasn't as strong of a campaign running. Uh, to to give in, uh, give information about what exactly we were looking at, um, and as a matter of fact, um, you know, really before that first attempt in Colorado, I wasn't too familiar with um, what was in the Colorado uh, Constitution regarding slavery. You know, um, I just um, I just assumed that you know we didn't have slavery in our Constitution because Colorado wasn't a state um, until after the Civil War. And so um, when I joined in 2018, um, I was more than honored because it was, it was a personal fight for me. I've had family members um, who were incarcerated, um, many of whom were accused of crimes that they did not uh, commit. Um, one of them was my, uh, my uncle Joe Bell Jr., who was um, incarcerated for 21 years for a crime he didn't commit. And he told me stories about um, um, slave-like conditions that he was forced into. And um, eventually the, um, you know, the, the labor consumed his body and he, he passed away some years later. And so I did not want to live in a state that um, had a constitution that allowed that kind of mistreatment um, to go unchecked. I wanted to live in a state whose constitution protected me and protect members of my family. And so um, fortunately, when I joined, I was able to um, uplift his name in, in, in memory because of that. And because of, uh, because of the life he, he lived and because of the way he died, I bring his name into this space here. Uh, the 2018 campaign um, was actually very similar to um, the campaign you all are running right now. Uh, we ran a resolution to the ballot that was um, 
supported by both Republicans and Democrats. It was all unan uh, uh, unanimous support. We, um, uh, and once it was on the ballot, we pushed and pushed and pushed uh, educating people about the, the very history that uh, Dr. Smith had talked about. Um, and we successfully, you know, became the first uh, state to remove both slavery and involuntary servitude uh, that November. Um, since then, uh, I've been in communication with, uh, of course, Representative Hollins and uh, members from other states who are wanting to do this as well. You all are in the middle of a growing national movement of states and organizers and legislators who are fighting tooth and nail to right the wrongs of history. Um, Utah is just one state with this in their language, but I'm hoping that it will be one more without it. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your personal ties to this that, that keep you going. I, I wanna bring in Aaron in this conversation. Aaron, is slavery practice in Utah prisons? And is it more, is the issue more than just changing the literature? Um, is, is this a real problem here in Utah? That's a question I don't feel, um, I, I don't think I can answer that question. I have not ever been incarcerated in the state of Utah. And so for folks who don't know, we run a, we run a program, um, a higher education program in Draper. Um, we've also got some programming starting in Gunnison and we do some outreach to our local jails serving adults. And I think what I was hoping to share today is, you know, when we talk to our students, um, our students who are inside um, and some are in for a very long time, some might be getting out in the next couple of years. We've just had a couple of students who were released um, last month. Um, there are very few jobs at the Utah State Prison in Draper. There are not enough jobs for everyone to have one. And so a job is a really important aspect of our students' lives. Um, and all of our students work, which means that we do a lot of our programming at night. And so you know, to hear the students talk about this is really interesting because on one hand, you have a bunch of, um, I'm going to say, kind of left-leaning activists, and I might even consider myself part of that group at times, that say, you know, prison labor is wrong. And I think we can absolutely say that and, in the same breath, say opportunities should be provided to people um, so that they have opportunities to gain skills and interact and create and to have some semblance of meaning. Um, so I would say to your first question, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it depends on how we define slavery. And I think partly, you know, this is such an important part of any kind of movement toward more racial equity. We have to abolish slavery in the Constitution, in language. The caveat in the referendum that you'll see is that abolishing the language, removing the language doesn't interfere with correctional industries essentially so it's not going to interfere with the current operations that are happening right now and i think that's a broader question that comes next which is should people who are incarcerated in the state of utah make 31 cents an hour is that something that we can get behind um, and if it's not then we should change it and we should work on increasing that wage and making sure that people who are under state confinement are able to earn um, uh, more appropriate and humane wages. Senator Andrek, did you want to chime in on that? Um, it's a it's a good question. I think it's worthy of discussion. Um, my understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong. I am the chair of the Executive Offices and Criminal Justice Appropriations Committee, so I fund the projects, right? Um, my understanding is that there aren't enough jobs for people down there. So, um, and it's voluntary. There's nothing, there's nothing forced. Um, but the question is, is that sufficient? I mean, they're very limited on what they can do as far as they, they have to be able to be in a program that is not going to introduce problems into the prison culture down there. Uh, and then the other aspect of that is, is it, 
is there a justifiable argument to pay them more when it's a voluntary thing? You know, they get to choose to do it if they want to or not. And it gives them extra money that they can use at the, what they call the commissary, I guess. Um, and also pay down whatever restitution they have. Is it fair to pay them more when it's voluntary, when it's costing us quite a bit to keep them incarcerated in the first place? I think it's worthy of a discussion. Um, I just am not entirely certain that we're equating these two things. Like slavery, I agree with the representative Hollins, this is absolutely wrong. If what we're talking about what's happening in the current prison system uh, is that, I would be against it. I don't think that that's what we are talking about. But once again, this is my understanding. I've, I've toured the facility and, it, and the, the inmates that I spoke to were like, I'm glad I get to do this because yeah, it's not very much, but the commissary is not fair market prices either. They're all much reduced fees anyway. So I, I don't know. They're there out of their own accord. Many of them use it to also buy supplies that they like to use for their classroom settings. Um, so I don't know. It's it's worthy of a discussion. I just am not entirely certain that this is in, entirely an apples to apples comparison, but maybe it is. I don't know. I'd love to have a conversation. And this issue is opening up a lot of conversations, important conversations that are happening right now, especially given um, the, the temperature of the nation right now and everything that's going on. Representative Hollins, what do you think this will do to help bridge the racial divide in Utah? You know, I think this is doing exactly what I wanted to do. It is starting that conversation. We're talking about um, um, in inequities in our communities. We're talking about um, um, racism in our community and we're talking about prison reform in our community. But you know, let me go back a little bit. When we sit and we look at the reason why this was placed in the constitution of the United States, it was placed in there um, to, it, it was placed in there to mass incarcerate individuals and particularly black men um, for economic reasons. Um, right after the Emancipation Proclamation was written, um, plantations and factories, um, they, were, they were wondering how they're gonna survive without all, all of this free labor. And so this was the beginning of the writing of the black codes. This was written in in order to make those, um, those um, in power feel more comfortable about ending slavery. And so these black codes was written where black men in particular were arrested for any reason. They were, they were arrested because more than two were congregating on the street because they didn't have their papers on them out in public proving that they had a job. Um, so any, for littering, for laundering. And so they were arrested in, in mass amounts and then they were leased out back into the public for economic reasons. So the, 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 the government was making money off of this, these individuals. So this was the beginning of the mass incarceration of black, of, of black men. And so we have to look at this in that context and why this was written in into our constitution and Utah um, although I have not been able to find any evidence, and I've spoken to some um, historians about um, prison leasing in this state, but was told that Utah was um, on the verge of becoming, of being able to join the union. And so they were trying to comply. They were trying to become a state. And so they were trying to comply with what the federal government was doing. And so they placed this in, in their constitution. So just want us to remember that the, the history of this and why this was written into our constitution. But yes, it's doing exactly what I wanted to do. It is sparking conversation. And we all know that conversation and understanding is the beginning of healing. Dr. Smith, if you could address how something like this could lie dormant in Utah's constitution for over a hundred years, and not only here in Utah, but also in other states as well. I think about a dozen states still have this in their constitution. Well, I, I think what, what happens is things become part of culture and also tradition. So you don't necessarily need a law as uh, Representative Hollins uh, just talked about to carry on the same kind of customs or practices that when you have systemic racism, this systemic gendered racism, 
to prevent people from occupying or living in certain places. So uh, the, one of the historians here, Dr. Harvey Cantor, who's a professor emeritus, uh, retired, talked about how uh, Irish and Greeks and, and other so-called less than European groups were put on the east side or west side of Salt Lake City along with um, blacks. And some of the so-called well-to-do whites were on the west side of, of Utah. Um, again, let me correct that. On the east side of Utah was where the you know, University of Utah is. So they were on the east side, but the so-called less than were on the west side. And we still have that type of um, orientation about what the east side and west side means to people. So when I moved here in 1999, I was told don't live on the west side of Utah. Right, I'm, and coming from Chicago, I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they ha had all these codes, right, to say what less than, well, the schools, or um, they don't have these certain things in the neighborhood. But when you looked at the history, and Dr. Cantor did an excellent job of breaking that down, and later um, uh, Ed Buendia and some others have looked at the history of the East-West Side divide, you could see who was being privileged and who wasn't, suspension rates. Uh, so you don't need a law to continue a practice of a custom uh, that the law provided you to do legally. So you can just do that within the system. So higher rates of um, suspension, higher rates of, um, uh, or lower um, rates of uh, giving students um, equitable, equitable treatment books and things like that. So I think that's part of what's happening in many of the um, um, states. So they don't remember that law being uh, in the books, but the custom and the practices and the other things. So same thing with the, um, the water park here where blacks couldn't um, participate in it for, for years, all the way up through uh, the 60s until one, actually one white man who took over the park said, he wasn't going to tolerate that anymore, right? So part of culture, part of uh, traditions. So I think that begs the question, Kamal, what have you noticed? Um, have you noticed anything change? Have you noticed any kind of a difference since this was passed in Colorado? I think that's one of the most important questions to ask um, this afternoon. Um, walking into the Amendment A campaign in Colorado in 2018, we knew very well that this was a fight specifically to close a loophole within the Constitution. What we also knew was that uh, labor and wage practices are determined in different, um, uh, in different places, such as in the legislature and in the Department of Corrections policy. We had to distinguish one fight from the other to say that these two are morally connected. But what we're doing with this constitution is planting a seed for racial justice. That this seed is a commitment to say that no matter what our criminal justice system looks like, it should never ever look like slavery or involuntary servitude. And it is making sure that our, our constitution our state's founding and most powerful document stands by that fact. With that being said, um, there were quite a few people who had hopes that this would immediately translate to broader criminal justice reform. That there were some folks who called us after the passage of Amendment A and they said, Kamau, I'm, um, I'm really happy that this passed, but tell me why is my nephew still working um, for eight cents an hour? Under, under the threat of violence. Why is, this, why is this still happening on the ground level? And um, one, thing that we've, one thing that we came face to face with is the fact that we had never in the United States had a place that affirmatively opposed both slavery and involuntary servitude. And because of that, we therefore did not legally know what that that there were other states that never had language, 
um, concerning slavery and involuntary servitude, but they um, deferred automatically to the um, uh, to ratifying what's in the Thirteenth Amendment. That Colorado became the first place to affirmatively oppose both slavery and involuntary servitude, and because of that, we knew that. Um, that the fight for broader criminal justice reform efforts would, would need to be a, a, a second step. But also we knew that um, this we knew that this could potentially open up opportunities through litigation. The um, the first uh, uh, the first thing that, that would probably come directly from this is actually a um, a lawsuit in Colorado that is currently challenging um, uh, wage practices uh, and labor. Um, we are in communication with the attorney on on this case, but you know, to be honest, um, that's that's the only thing that happened. You know, in direct correlation with this, um, this this fight is is so much more connected to uh, closing a potential loophole than it is about immediate reform. But I want to be very clear that. Uh, the fight cannot stop here, that this needs to be the first step on a very long staircase. Senator Andrick, you wanted to add to that? I could not agree more. I think you're spot on. Um, I know Representative Hollins and I, uh, since, you gotta remember, when we, when we put this on the ballot, this was before George Floyd. This was, I mean, it was there. I'm not trying to say it wasn't there. It was always been there, right? But we were doing this because it was the right thing to do. But then now everything's kind of really gone crazy. Uh, I just want to show you, uh, this is a report that was produced by our Department of Public Safety. Representative Hollins and myself, Senator Escamilla, uh, Senator Evan Vickers are working with the Department of Public Safety to put together a series of for uh, custody bills, uh, things like ban on chokeholds, knee holds, use of force, transparency uh, to officer misconduct, citizen review boards, and municipalities, body cams for every officer. I mean, there's 19 items. We, we held a forum where we had many, many organizations, 19, I think it was, Sandra, I can't remember, 17 organizations that represented communities of color, and they kind of lit out a whole litany of things that they said that they wanted to see. Truth is, of these 19 things, we think there's probably eight or nine of them we, we can get agreement on, and I guarantee you're gonna see legislation this coming legislative session that's gonna address those items. Then you got about five items, six items in there that can be done, but we're gonna need to work through exactly how to do it, like better training for mental health engagements for law enforcement officers. How do you share the, the health information? My point is, I could not agree anymore. You're absolutely correct. And we are taking additional steps here in the state of Utah to adjust these. And some of them are going to be tough. Some of them are going to take a couple of years to work out exactly how to get the policy right, because we want our children within our communities of color to come home at night. We also want our law enforcement officers to come home at night. And getting that right, figuring out that balance is what we are absolutely committed to do for as long as it takes. So my two cents, thank you. And we have a couple of questions coming in on YouTube. There's a lot of conversation going on. Just wanna remind folks that if they have questions for the panelists, please put them on YouTube and uh, we will get those to the panelists and get you some answers as quickly as possible. But I wanna uh, shoot another question over to Representative Hollins. What do you have to say to people who feel like this is just a symbolic move in that it won't really change anything here in Utah? Yes, so my answer to that is that this loophole is in our state constitution, our most historic document in the state. One that we have based our laws on is a living document that we have been changing. Until this is out of that constitution, everyone in our state do not, they're not equal. They can be placed back into according to our constitution can be placed back into slavery. Do I think that maybe some lawyer years from now may try to use this or a judge? I don't know, but I would rather take it out than to have it 
hanging over our heads. Um, it, it needs to go. So do I think it's symbolic? It could be, but it's also a legal document. It is also our, our, our do, uh, institutional document and it needs to be taken out. All right, I'm gonna to go to one of the first audience questions. Someone wants to know when prisoners serve time in jail and do work, don't they get good time for time served and let out early? Don't prisoners in the Utah prison system get additional good time and get out early? And I think they're they're saying that um, in reference to how much they get paid for, for when they do work. Um, Senator Andrade, can you? Respond yeah, to that. in fact, in the state of Utah, uh, less than 20% of prisoners serve their full sentence. So more than 80% are getting out for good behavior or for, I hate to say it, but in some instances, nonviolent crimes, and we've got more people coming in and there's just not enough room. I hate to say it, but that, that does happen. But uh, by and large, I don't know if it's tied to the 31 cents. I don't think that, I don't know that those are correlated. They may be, but I don't think that they are. I think most people are getting out early. Um, over over 80% are not serving their full uh, sentence. Thank you. Right. And another question we have from the audience, what companies benefit from the 31 cent in our jobs versus paying minimum wages for uh, to the, to regular workers? All right, Senator Andre. My understanding is that um, it, the state has an internal department that actually produces things like license plates. So it's actually, my understanding is that these are either companies or the state itself that are producing for benefit to the state. There isn't anything that's for profit is my understanding. Once again, I, I'm, I could be wrong on that. Maybe there, maybe Aaron has some additional information, but um, my understanding is it's all for contracts to the state, but I could be wrong. Yeah, Aaron, can, can you jump in? Sure, sure. It's Utah Correctional Industries, and it is the um, business arm of the state corrections division. And so it does um, many state contracts. The University of Utah orders things from the prison all the time, um, in part, because the bids are low. If you're only paying people 31 cents an hour, um, you're likely outbidding other, other businesses. And so um, it does play, uh, I think, you know, license plates are one example, but um, we, the University of Utah has ordered furniture and t-shirts. I mean, there's a printing press out there. Folks are doing CAD, they're, they're building so many things. And so I think that would be just something that I encourage people to check out is to actually look up what is, um, what is being produced um, by incarcerated people in our state um, and just take an interest in, in what those labor conditions might look like, what are being, what's being paid um, and how much money is actually being funneled through that so that people can get a sense of that industry because it's largely invisible to people unless you're in the system. Um, we kind of exist without really knowing that the furniture I'm sitting on at the University of Utah in the classroom was made um, with prison labor. And actually, the, the, the furniture, Sandra, that you and I sit on up at the Capitol, prison labor, just so you know. I mean, it, it, we use it. Uh, the signs on the side of the road that UDOT uses, prison labor. So um, that's, where, that's where it's ultimately being used. My understanding is it's not for any company that's a for-profit company outside of the, the prison system, though. Representative Pollins, can you talk about the impact this would have, if any, on prison work programs and, and sentencing? Sure. This um, should not have any impact on, on the prison programs. As was said, stated earlier, I think it was Kamal um, stated earlier, um, prison labor is a conversation that we need to have. Absolutely. And it's a conversation that I'm willing to have and that I want to have um, also a, um, around training in our, in, in the system, in, in the system. I, I, I believe that when people come out of that system that they should, um, my hope is that they will have the skills to be able to get back into the workforce economically, you know, which is the reason why I ran Ban the Box because I recognize that there are people who were formerly incarcerated who, could not participate economically in our system. 
in the system and they want to, they want to be very productive. And so um, that's what I would like to see. And, and in particular, also around our women in the system and how they're being trained. I know part of, um, I have received emails from individuals who have, who have stated to me um, that they feel that there should be more pro training programs and this in our prison system that's focused directly on our women and making sure that they are reunited with their kids and have the skills to be able to, um, to, to have that relationship again with their families and making sure that they have the skill set to be able to to find jobs once they once they get out. So no, this is this is not going to in any way affect that. This is just the first, this is something that needs to be taken out of our constitution. But yes, we need to have conversations around around all of that. We it, it's a conversation that's long overdue that we need to have. And Kamal, the, the work continues. I know that New Jersey and there are several other states that have this on the ballot as well. Can you talk a little bit about the next steps? What's what's going to happen next in this battle to, to make sure that this is no longer on the constitution in, in all states across the country? Sure, so um, I'm, I'm going to speak from the perspective of the Abolish Slavery National Network. Um, we became a national network in May of this year, primarily because um, myself and some of the other Colorado organizers were getting all these people out of, you know, um, out of Utah and out of uh, Nebraska and out of New Jersey and South Carolina, and Texas, and New York, and all these other places, um, asking specifically, like, how did we message this? What are the campaign materials that you used? What were your strategies? So. In May, um, we decided just to hop on this call together to um, first just to get to know each other. Um, and that's where, you know, we, you know, we, you know, from from one time zone all the way to the other, we um, we, we got on the call for solidarity. And, and when we uh, ended that call, we decided that we wanted to formally become an organizing network of states. Um, so I would say um, that the most immediate steps look like this. We, um, we actually have just two states on the, on the ballot this year, Utah and, and Nebraska. New Jersey was about to get on the ballot, but um, there were some complications with getting it onto the, uh, getting the resolution passed. Um, I know that this was attempted, um, <clears throat> that there was an attempt in Ohio to get this on the ballot this year. Uh, for one reason or another, I, I don't believe that this is going to be on the ballot in Ohio this year. Um, but um, as a national network, our primary responsibility is to support um, support the states that are up for you know up for the ballot this year, including working with Representative Hollins and the um, Abolish Slavery campaign uh, and coalition that they've put together. Um, as a national network, we are taking a state by state approach, um, although our our ultimate goal is to abolish slavery out of every state constitution and out of the um, and to repeal and replace the 13th Amendment of the United States so that it could um, it could also uh, be affirmatively opposed to both slavery and involuntary servitude. So um, this is a growing movement. And uh, my hope is that uh, the voters here in Utah or there in Utah, because I'm in Colorado, um, will, uh, you know, will lead as a shining example of um, why these seeds need to be planted. And we have another question from the audience who wants um, someone to address the challenges that former prisoners have when trying to find a job with a conviction record. Um, Aaron, can, can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Representative Hollins's leadership on Ban the Box is huge. Um, and I think if you look across states, um, we need to see more statewide efforts in this area. Um, I'm, I'm in academia, I'm a higher ed scholar. And so I think the next terrain that we've really got to tackle is higher ed. Um, we've got a handful of, of institutions in Utah right now that require criminal history disclosure as part of the admissions process. Um, we deny admission to students every year because of prior criminal history without 
many standards without um, really kind of any consistent practices. And so this is, it makes it for our students who are released and who want to continue their post-secondary education, that is where we see one of the largest impacts of discrimination. Um, and it's compounded discrimination, right? Because you're often released with debt, whether, um, I think the Senator spoke to this earlier, and it's not debt that necessarily, um, you know, you purposely accrued, but, but the, the kind of circumstances of being incarcerated means that you're going to accrue debt um, in addition to any kind of things that you have to pay as a result of your crime of conviction. And then getting out and trying to meet the stipulations of parole and probation, which oftentimes mandate some kind of work. Um, nine times out of 10, you have to have some kind of employment. And so what we hear most often from our students is that the kinds of jobs that they um, you know, imagine going from making furniture and having a job for over a decade where you're doing design and where you're helping to problem solve and you're working collaboratively and you're given some respect about the skills that you have. And when you get out, there's only a handful of places that will hire you. And the biggest feedback that we hear from our alumni is that they're bored. Mm -hmm. They're bored. They're being underutilized. They're being undervalued. Mm -hmm. And they face extreme discrimination and trying to get into jobs that would allow them to climb the social mobility ladder. Um, and so I think we have a lot of work to do inside, but what we often talk about is we have a lot of work to do on the outside. We have to educate people on why it's important to hire people with incarceration history, mm -hmm. why it's important to, to um, invite them into our neighborhoods and to become part of communities. I mean, this has to be part of the broader effort that we do. Otherwise we can do all these things. And if we're gonna shut the doors in people's faces once they're out, then we're just making it worse for everyone. Yeah. Senator Andre. Yeah. yeah, that I could, uh, once again, I couldn't agree anymore. I think you're spot on. The, this is going to be a problem I think we're going to be dealing with for uh, forever, maybe. I hope not, but but possibly forever. As long as we're, we have a system of corrections that, that incarcerates people, there's going to be this stigma. There's going to be this problem. I ran Senate Bill 201 this last session because what we found is that we had training within the corrections facilities that was helping people like get all of their training to become an electrician when they got out. But then once they got out, the Department of uh, Occupational Professional Licensing, because they had that felony conviction, was saying, no, oh, you've got to be seven years out before you can get a, a, an electrician's license. And I was like, is that not the biggest disconnect? We're going to train this person over here and then prohibit them from getting a license over here. This is the dumbest thing in the world. So we ended up removing more than 80% of what the restrictions were or reducing them. We still left some restrictions. For instance, if you're, you know, child sex offender, we're not going to let you go teach primary age children. There's still just some issues there. But um, by and large, we have to get out of our own way. And a lot of the concepts of what we used to think was this is just the way it's always been done. That's crap. Okay, we need to do a better job. We've got us. We've got to better align it so that when someone is like, you know what, I've paid my debt to society they can come out and they can actually start making a living and not fall back into some of the same problems before. But when they have served their debt to society, as far as we're concerned, they come out and no, you haven't. Here's another. And here's another. We're going to give you more and more and more. Nobody's going to dig themselves out of that. And, and are we at all curious as to why our recidivism rates are so high? We've got to do a better job. Hands down. And Representative Holland, Holland do you wanted to add to that? Yes, I want to add to that. Um, Aaron was talking about earlier about um, um, people getting back in the workforce with, um, in, with, who are formerly incarcerated. I remember reading a study um, a while back, and I can't remember who did this study that said that when you hire someone who is formerly incarcerated, they work harder and they are better employees than actually your the employees who don't have that background because they are so grateful and they are so happy to be there. Um, and they want to, to prove that they, um, they want to prove themselves. And so they turn out to be better employees, you know, and when I say better employees, I mean less likely to, to, to come in late and, and take off early, you know, those kind of things. And so I want to put that out there. But as we're talking about 
livable wages, um, which is true, and giving people these second chances. Let's also talk about discrimination in housing for people with who are formerly incarcerated. You know, I've worked as a licensed clinical social worker with my primary focus being on the, the um, those experiencing homelessness. And one of the biggest obstacles we face or we have faced is those who have these, who are formerly incarcerated trying to get into housing. And landlords will not take chances on them. And some cities actually promote policies or have policies in place that incentivizes landlords not to rent to these individuals. And so that is another piece that we have to look at. And that's something else that we have to, we're going to have to address in this state. And when we, we talked about uh, individuals getting back in the community, you know, I, I represent the West side that Dr. Smith was talking about. That is my community. I love my community. I love where I live. Yet when we have individuals who are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, we want to put them all in one area all in one area. And if you talk to individuals, not everybody wants to live on the West side. And that includes people who are formerly incarcerated. I've had clients who've stated, I wanna live in this area of the state. I wanna live in that area of the state. And I think they should have that option. And we are a not in my backyard state. And, but we, I always say on the West side, we, we are very welcoming to everyone on the West side. That's one of the things I'm, I'm proud of my community, but we are uh, also not a, a only in my backyard community. We want everyone to take on the responsibility of in integrating these individuals back into their communities. An another audience question that we have is what kind of amendments or policies can state legislatures implement to help former prisoners? Has this already been addressed in Utah's state legislature? Um, I can say one of the things that I've, as mentioned earlier, was ban the, ban the box um, that I ran. Um, it's around state employees, state employment. Um, I know some states have run it around private employees. I know that trying to initiate that up at our capital with our legislators, you know, it's not going to pass. But one of the things I would love to see is private um, employers volunteer to, 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 to try to integrate individuals who are formerly incarcerated into their workforce, you know, with some type of training or, or, or what have you. I know one of the things that I have been, um, I've had a young man to approach me about trying to create some type of um, certification program for individuals who have been incarcerated, who are coming out to um, some type of certification programs with paperwork and some type of skills um, classes that they've gone to that they're able to take that to employers and say, look, yes, I've been formerly incarcerated, but look what I've been doing. Look at the, look the classes I've been taking and this is what I've been doing um, to try to get back in the workforce to rehabilitate myself. So that's one of the things that I am um, looking at doing, but I'm sure there's, there's a whole lot more that, that we can do to try to incentivize people to get back into the workforce. And, and we talked about earlier Amendment C opening up this conversation into, you know, all the, the broader issues that come along with in, in mass incarceration and how it's done today. Can you talk about, Dr. Smith, what is racial battle fatigue? I know, I know you've written about this before. Can you talk about that, how that comes into play now and, and what we can do to make sure that people don't get tired or, or, or don't get burnt out while trying to push these changes? Well, racial battle fatigue in the most simplest way of trying to explain it is the responses to dealing with um, racism on a daily basis. Um, racism, daily racism and institutionalized racism. And it's the biopsychosocial responses to that. So everybody has a physiological response, a psychological response, emotional, behavioral. And over time, when you have to continue to use our resources just to fight gendered racism, it could become overwhelming, taxing, uh, and it can lead to uh, lower lifespan. So it, it impacts your mobility and mortality rates. One of the ways that we can uh, deal with that is what we're doing right now, having open and honest conversations, people who might not agree on all matters, but coming together around social justice issues to make sure that life uh, and living is is better for all people. 
we need to practice some um, adaptive uh, resilience practices. Um, so that what that means also is to come together with supportive networks um, to be able to move away from uh, a hostile environment to just be able to relax, um, to, to recuperate, um, to not be so overwhelmed with those systems that tend to cause you stress. So we, we just have to do many of these kind of pro-social uh, adaptive coping mechanisms uh, and then just watch ourselves. You know, it's, it's much like the um, pandemic that we're dealing with now with COVID-19. There's also a pandemic of economic um, discrimination, but the greatest pandemic is racism. It's global. And just like you have to wear a mask um, to protect yourself from other folks, we need to wear a mask to protect ourselves from dealing with racial battle fatigue. So you've got to be careful on bringing that home to other people because you're being exposed to it in a different domain. So whatever practice you, practices you can do to promote health and healthy living, that will help others. Um, there was a great study that was recently done that's talked about linked lives, linked lives. And what they looked at was Chicano families. And what they found in those uh, in that study was a, a major study is that um, fathers, so Chicano fathers and Chicano mothers who have to deal with daily racism uh, impact the lives of their children and their children's depression and stress levels. The interesting thing in that finding was that the father's uh, experiences with daily racism had a greater impact on the children than the mothers. That didn't mean that the mothers didn't experience racism. It just means that there's a different kind of attack that's um, hitting those fathers and it is impacting the whole family. The, the findings also show that it didn't go the other way. So whatever the children, those you were going through, didn't impact their parents as much. So we have to be very clear that somebody might go through something and their experiences can impact other people in our family. Right, we are coming to the end of our hour for the discussion, but before I get to the your final thoughts, I, I do wanna get one more audience question in. Uh, someone wants to know, has there been pushback on Amendment C in Utah and is it expected to pass and be implemented. I, I was shocked to hear that there was hostile pushback in Colorado when they were trying to get it passed. Ha have we seen anything um, that to that nature here in Utah? Representative Hollins? Sure. Um, I have not seen any organized pushback to this. Um, I have received a couple of emails of people who opposed this. Uh, maybe two or three emails from people who are positive, but no organized pushback. Um, I think Jake may have received more negative emails than I have regarding this piece of legislation. Well, to be clear, negative. I don't have anybody who's come right out that says, this is stupid. Why are you doing, I think slavery is great. I've had nobody say that, okay. I have had a few people, more of my far right, you know, it's, you know, I'm a Republican, I'm in Northern Utah County, so I've only got 3% African Americans in my district. Um, most everybody else is white. Um, and just a few people going, why are we doing this? Because I don't think that this is an issue. This is like a virtue signal, you know, this is, it's good and we all agree with it, but ultimately at the end of the day, this isn't gonna change anything in the real world. And I've had to gently just say, all right, you're entitled to your opinion, but our documents matter. They matter. They say, they say who we are, what our values are, and who we are as a people. And I truly believe, coming as a re conservative Republican from Northern Utah County, I don't think I'm racist. That doesn't mean that we don't deal in a system that has issues that, uh, that, do, that are racist. I don't think I'm racist. And I think the vast majority of my constituents are not racist. So I, I, I've gotten a, a few of those, but not many, five, six. And by and large, everyone's like, yeah, this seems to make sense. So I haven't seen any, you know, uh, cross the board opposition to this. I 
I personally think this is going to sail through and knocking on wood. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting anyone that's like got their hair on fire over this amendment. Thank goodness. All right. I'm, I'm going to go around my screen and just call each of you out for your final thoughts on this as we wrap this up, starting with Kamal. I, um, I want everybody to know that this is a historic fight. Um, we are finally righting the wrongs of history. And because of that, um, I'm going to encourage every voter in the state of Utah to vote yes on Amendment C to abolish slavery. And that's all I got to say. Aaron? Um, I just want to circle back quickly to one of the audience's questions about, you know, what can state policy do? And I think state policy can do a lot. Uh, one of the things that we're not doing well right now is funding comprehensive um, college prep and higher education for our adults and our juveniles who are held in custody. Um, and that is policy that is doable. We have the expertise here um, and we have the opportunity to really expand opportunities so that when people are released, they're not starting from scratch. They're not having to kind of rebuild all these things. They're bringing with them some wealth and knowledge and skills. Um, and importantly, as been mentioned, things on paper. It's important to, to provide credentials. It's important to provide opportunities. And uh, we've got a lot of growth that we can do in that area. Um, I would say that's one. And then I'm just going to encourage another shout out here to to really, um, you know, bring Yushi in and to reconsider the use of prior criminal histories in college admissions. We've got other states that we can turn to that have um, removed that requirement from the initial application. Um, and I think it's it's something that would um, be really helpful here. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Well, I'll, I'll briefly just say um, in response to that question that Representative Hollins was asked about the symbolic nature of this act, um, whether it's symbolic or not, I agree with everybody on the panel that it needs to be removed, but what isn't symbolic is a fight for social justice. And I think that's where you see the Senator and the representative coming together. So what that means is a recognition and understanding that there still is systemic racism, that there still is racism, and that we all can agree, just like a, a Illinois governor from where, the state that I'm from saw that there, who was a Republican, saw that there was an injustice in the um, criminal justice system on, on death sentences that disproportionately they were killing black men who were innocent. Um, and DNA evidence uh, proved that. So you don't have to be with one party or the other. You just have to recognize that social justice is a value that you should have and that racism still exists and that we all should be fighting to remove it. Thank you. Senator Andrick. Um, I would just like to say that it, it was an honor uh, to work with Sandra on this, Representative Hollins. Um, I think truly we are finally bringing in line what I believe is Utah values to what our founding documents actually are. And I think that the message of that is, is, is powerful. We are writing a historical injustice. And whether we want to call it social injustice or whatever, I just think anytime we find injustice, it is our responsibility as citizens. I don't care if you're black, white, whatever, okay? If there is injustice, we've got to do our part to stand up and say, hold up, that's not right. Because I think it was Dr. King who said, if we see injustice anywhere and we don't act, we are complicit. And I'm not gonna be that guy. So I urge you all to vote for Amendment C. Anyone who's paying attention, anyone who's turning in, vote for Amendment C, it, it, it matters. And last but certainly not least, Representative Hollins. Thank you. I first wanna acknowledge um, Utah Coalition to Abolish Slavery and all of the work that they have been doing. I have to tell you that they have done 99% of the work in getting this out in the state of Utah. Um, a group of people from different organizations and individuals who have come together, who have said, um, we want to help, let's start working on this. So I first want to acknowledge them. I also want to acknowledge the Abolish Slavery National Network and Kamal and all of the work that he's doing. And I want to encourage you to go to both the websites, abolishslaveryutah.org, 
um, org and also the Body Slavery Net National Network uh, website if you want to learn more information on what you can do to help um, with this movement that is happening locally and nationally. And I'm going to strongly um, uh, encourage you to vote for Amendment C. All right, thank you all very much. November 3rd, election day, have a plan, get out there and vote. Early voting going on right now. So if you have your mail-in ballot, be sure to vote. And I'm going to turn it back over to the Hinckley Institute, but it has been a pleasure having this really important discussion with you all. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here.